One of the least convincing and most dishonest arguments against school choice is that it's a stalking horse for segregation. The Duke historian Nancy McLean advanced this argument in her controversial book, Democracy in Chains, as has the progressive education historian Diane Ravitch, who asserts that the school choice movement was created by white Southern governors who were fighting the Brown decision. Chris Stewart is the head of the education nonprofit Brightbeam and a prolific writer and podcaster who publishes under the name Citizen Stewart. He argues that minority voters overwhelmingly support charter schools, vouchers, and other choice programs, usually at higher rates than whites do, and for good reason. There isn't an issue facing black people today that doesn't find its origins in K-12 education, Stewart writes. A Christian and a libertarian, Stewart says that school lockdowns over the past year have forced parents to become more involved and attentive to their children's education and may well lead to an exodus from traditional public schools. In a wide-ranging conversation, Stewart also talks about why he believes the government shouldn't be in charge of curricula and why support for school choice will continue to grow despite efforts by teacher unions and education bureaucrats to maintain a failing status quo. Chris Stewart, thanks for talking to Reason. Hey, thanks for having me, Nick. I appreciate it. Let's start by talking about the past year in K through 12 education. I am glad both that I was not a student nor uh, my children are out of K through 12. So like, I am glad I didn't have to deal with this. I know you did, but what are the essential lessons that we should be learning uh, from the COVID-19 lockdowns about K through 12 education? Mm, well, I think one of the, um, the most important lessons that we all learned as parents, those of us who have kids in the K-12 system, is that um, um, government is not always going to be reliable for us. So this was the first time in mass that government gave us our kids back and said, here, have at her because we, we have nothing for you right now. And it was the first time for many parents that they um, they encountered the idea that, whoa, wow, I am entirely responsible for these young people in my house. Um, and it may have been the first time they had to exercise muscles as parents that they haven't had to exercise before because for so many years, um, education has professionalized parents out of the educational equation. And over periods of time, it has infantilized parents to the point where we can't even imagine being responsible totally for our kids' education. And in this last year, became abundantly clear government had nothing for us. They said, basically, um, uh, we'll get back to you, right? Here's your kids. We'll get back to you. What was, you, uh, you know, for you, and I mean, you have a, uh, you know, I mean, you write, you, you are an education policy wonk, analyst, whatever. You were on the Minnesota school boards of education or Minneapolis school boards of education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what for you, what was the most challenging aspect of not only, you know, just beyond having your kids around all the time and, you know, let me, uh, you know, how old are they, et cetera. But then also, um, you know, like what was the most difficult thing that you faced as, as a parent trying to keep your kids educated? So our kids are, um, we have three still in the pipeline. We have five total. So we've been through this rodeo a few times, but we have three that are two grades uh, um, between each of them. There's, there's two grades um, and managing their various schedules and learning schedules and whatnot is a full-time job for one going back and forth with teachers because they're doing the remote learning from the district, which has just been, uh, it, it's, it's not that we shouldn't call it remote learning. We should just call it remote because <laughs> our kids are doing something remote. Um, it's become a full-time job really, um, just to stay in touch with their teachers, find out what, uh, assignments are missing and, you know, are they learning anything? It's been a lot of like, um, also just go look at this video and then fill out this worksheet. So it hasn't really been schooling. Um, in the back of my mind, it, it's been, uh, really hard to feel like maybe we're robbing them of a year of learning and of, of experiences. Um, so uh, that's been, I think, the, the, the most challenging, but it also has raised a lot of important questions that might have us thinking differently. Like this, this time a year and a half ago, we probably wouldn't have been homeschoolers. We wouldn't have considered it possible. Um, we have kids right now that would prefer to do homeschooling over going back to school or um, um, doing remote learning. So 
it's changed the world for us in how we look at education. Do you, uh, I mean, what do you think you'll do uh, on, on your family basis? Are you going to be like, okay, you know what, we're, we're going to actually do a focused intentional homeschooling? Or are you like, we got to open these schools up as fast as possible just to get my kids out of the house? Yeah, we're not in the latter. We're definitely not people who feel like, I think we've learned a lot about their learning. So if they, uh, um, we're probably more leaning towards uh, doing something we never would have considered doing, which is being full-time homeschoolers. We have one who, uh, one student who would probably want to go back for social life and for sports and other things. But we're definitely not sitting around like many people. I'm, I'm amazed at the number of parents that are pining for the schools to reopen as if their entire lives depend on it. I get it if it's economically um, necessary for your family. Um, but we've learned so much about what they haven't been learning We, you know, when they were in school and how much teaching hasn't been going on. I think there's a lot of parents who've gotten now earshot too of uh, some of the teaching that is going on and it has raised questions for them. Is it rigorous enough? Have our kids been getting a full education? Uh, you know, as we were, uh, per, you know, uh, kind of scheduling this and whatnot, you wrote to me uh, that uh, it, discussing topics we might go over, that it might be time to expand beyond school type and choice to parent determined education, which offers a broader set of learning options. And you continue to get there, we need to beef up parental muscles responsibility. Can you expand on what you mean by that? Um, you know, what, what are the muscles that parents, uh, I mean, you talked about it a, a, a second ago, but you know, what are the muscles that either weren't there or have atrophied? And what does it mean to kind of exercise muscles when it comes to your kid's education? Yeah, I think traditionally we have talked about school choice in terms of school choices. Which type of school should I choose? And part of that has been finding the right school to put your child in and then go on autopilot. Let the professionals or some other group of people really take over the intellectual development of our children. When you, when you have a child, when your child is born and you're looking at a baby, God has put into your hands something that you are responsible for in total, not in part. So the intellectual development of a person is kind of like the Martin Luther King talked about this. And I always uh, go back to this. He said the most precious thing that we have as a race is the intellectual development of our boys and girls. Um, and, and we have been outsourcing that for at least 150 years, but more like 90 years or so, we really were professionalized out of the idea that we know anything about how to develop a person, a human being, uh, even though we're parents. Um, now that we have them at home, we're having to make decisions. We're having to make choices. We're the president of their education now. So we're having to decide whether this curriculum or that curriculum is worth it, right? We're not relying on a school board to tell us which is the best curriculum. Many of us aren't. Some of us are still kind of just floundering, but many of us are still are starting for the first time having to make critical decisions about uh, customizing education to our specific humans that we have in our house. So in, in that sense, the, the kind of COVID lockdown is really uh, an accelerant of something that's been happening in, in American society, right? Because, I mean, homeschooling wasn't even legal a few decades ago. The idea of school choice came down to, are you going to, you know, if you're super wealthy, you would, you know, send your kids to some kind of fancy boarding school or whatever. If you were an inner city Catholic person, you would might send your kids to a parochial school or you would go to the public school or you would move so your kids would go to whatever was considered a good public school. Um, but over the past, you know, 20, 30 years, uh, you know, people have taken more of an interest in things like school choice or, or individualized education. Where, I guess, where did the professionalization of teaching and kind of shutting parents out, where did that come from? And then why did it break down to a point now where, you know, more and more parents, even, you know, and especially after COVID, are saying, you know what, I got I to I gotta be involved with my kids' education in the same way that I am in like picking their clothes. Yeah, you know, so if you go way back, if you read um, David, I think it's uh, Tayek, Hayek's uh, One Best System um, from years ago. It's like a seminal work in how we advanced to be an administrative school system, um, how we went from the one house, one, uh, one room schoolhouse with one teacher to being very consolidated state run education with a bunch of bureaucrats on top and 
um, many professionals at many different layers and levels. That happens slowly over time with the consolidation of public education. Um, I think the stat is today we have twice the number of students, but half the number of schools that we did maybe 50 or 60 years ago, which means that we consolidate. Yeah, I know in terms of boards or uh, uh, boards of education or school districts, from uh, the end of World War II, there was, you know, over 100,000 or 200,000, some insane number of different school districts. And now it's like one tenth that or something. Yeah, it's like 14,000 now, um, which is hyper consolidation by the state of the education process. Before you got low, you were local, 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 local. <laughs> you were super local. Um, and today you are um, not. Right. So, so what, uh, what started the pushback against that? You know, I can't say 100% there was one thing that I can think of that, um, but I do know that there were freedom movements of different sorts. So within the black community, for instance, during the civil rights movement, many of the, so people forget about this, but people like Dr. King and many of the civil rights leaders actually put their kids into elite black private schools. So um, even as they were talking nationally about um, integrating the, the general public schools, they were actually putting their, their own children into um, privatized um, schools. Um, and and um, the Black Panthers did the same thing. They started schools in Oakland. That was one movement, one freedom movement. But also in the 1970s, you saw like just an explosion of um, a different type of school choice. You know, you started seeing open schools and schools without walls and, you know, schools on beanbag chairs and schools on roller skates. You know, I was just... very uh, <laughs> jealous growing up in the seventies. A friend of mine got, to, I, I went to a, a crappy Catholic school that was spent probably one third of what the local public schools did. Um, and so, and it was a kind of a holdover from a different model of education that had ceased being, you know, taken seriously. But a friend of mine got to go to a new public school in my hometown of Middletown, New Jersey, where they had a tree house in the middle of the school. And I was like, oh, man, that is, <laughs> that is so cool. I, you know, we ended up, we ended up re, uh, meeting in the same graduate program. So it's like, you know, different paths to get to the same place. But, you know, this is an interesting point, though. Stick with that for a second, just in that, like in when it came to desegregation, one of the uh, one of the important learnings of desegregation is if you wanted everybody to go to school together, you were going to have to put in some pretty strong inducements. So you had a city like Kansas City, for instance, that spent one, you know, $1.2 billion, and that's billion with a B years ago, um, decades ago, and they had schools with aquariums and Olympic sized swimming pools and all these, you know, big, beautiful things that are still there now and aren't integrated anymore. But the interesting lesson that we should take, especially as libertarians about that, is that they decided if they were going to meet the end that they wanted to meet, they had to listen to their customer in ways that they never had before. They had to actually become customer specialists. What do you want in a school? And we will build it for you. It didn't work because, of course, it's government doing it again. But at least they realized magnet schools had to sell something. What uh, what what kind of uh, schooling did you go to for K through 12? Where did, where did you huh. grow up? And, uh, you know, how how do you rate your own education? Terrible. Absolutely, absolutely terrible. Probably one of the reasons why as a parent, well, first of all, much of my, I was very much an autodidact. Um, um, American public libraries did way more for me than American public schools ever could do for me. Um, and that's why I actually support that system more than, as the main education system, I support that more than I do public schools. Um, but uh, to answer more directly, I was in a different school for many years of my life, a different school just about every year. Um, I had a year in there of Catholic school but besides that, it was district schools um, in three different states, California, Minnesota, and uh, Louisiana. So I actually went to New Orleans public schools. I went to Minneapolis public schools for one year, uh, went to school in your city for a year at, uh, uh, in Bel Air, as a matter of fact. Uh, we lived in Baldwin Hills. I was bused to Bel Air, uh, and I never understood um, I never understood money like I did when I was bused into the, the school in Bel Air. So I was able to see schools from segregated to integrated, from north to south, from traditional to kind of experimental, from religious to non-religious to godless. Um, um, and as a parent, that for me just, it taught me, my own upbringing taught me that anything's possible. Like you don't have to do one traditional path to education. And you should look at your kids and decide for them what's most 
fitting for them, what's optimal, because you don't have to do one thing. Yeah. And I, and I guess, uh, I mean, you know, and, well, you have five kids, so that's like, you know, at least five different models of education you might be considering. And, you know, I say this as a parent and as somebody who cares about education, I went on to get a PhD in English because I'm that type of person. So I take education seriously, but it is a, you know, a hell of a lot of work to think about what your kid needs and then to figure out where to, where to get that for them and then to evaluate it and keep going. I kind of am, I, I'm sympathizing with the parents who are like, would you please open the schools up? Because that way, at least we're not seeing how little our kids are learning. They're out of the house. Yeah, I mean, there's safety in the government. Um, it's a, it's a called a safety net. That's the education safety net. You don't really have to think about it. You can go on autopilot. You can put your child, you can put one or two or three through the same doorway and pretend like it's optimal for all three of them for their development to do that. Um, I just, I think you're giving up a lot when you do that. And you're not being um, curious enough about government. Um, um, there's a question that we, we will never raise, like in conversations like this, that will never get raised. Um, when we see curriculum battles and uh, things like the 1776 project versus the 1619 project, we don't answer, we don't ask one essential question about that. Is it even ethical for a government that is supposed to be about the consent of the governed to develop its own bosses? its own people that it one day will answer to. Um, and that's a really important question to me because we are training people in mass. If you look at people like John Taylor Gatto and others um, who really asked, I think, elastic questions, like maybe you don't agree with them. Maybe you read it and you think, wow, this is really far out. You know, he's taken it really far about how free we are um, if we're being trained by government schools. Um, it's important, actually, to ask those Alaska questions, though, but really, should they be developing their own citizens um, to their own liking? I think we are dumbing down. M mass education is, I think, having an impact on the intellect of, of the United States, and we're seeing problems with it. We had people just storm a capital based upon a mountain of lies that only, it was like a million more on March. You could really only have that through a system of mass government education failure in my <laughs> mind. Um, so what, uh, I, I agree with you and, you know, particularly from a libertarian perspective, a small L libertarian perspective, you don't want the government creating a system that produces citizen, you know, good citizens from their point of view. By definition, they're not going to be critical thinkers and things like that. But of course, the government and other sources of power within a culture or a society are going to do that. So, you know, we're talking about school choice and not necessarily in terms of the type of school. What what replaces that? Does is there uh, in your framework, is there a an obligation that society or government has to fund education, but not the type of education? Um, should there be a complete separation between state and school? Uh, where, where do you come down on those types of issues? I really do like the way you just phrased that. There definitely should be a separation between state and school. I think we should stop thinking in terms of schools and start thinking in terms of the learning process, though. What does an ind individual learner need and who will make that decision and what resources will they have? to make that decision. So as far as I can tell, God gives you a parent or a guardian, that parent or that guardian is the one who makes the decision. And um, what resources do they have? Well, right now, you know, you have an average of anywhere, the numbers are, are shaky with people, but anywhere between 12 and $16,000 a year per person in, in your home state, it's I think upwards of 23,000 per student. Um, that's the resourcing that we give to a student. Um, um, or that's what we spend on them. We that's say what we spend, we spend on, them. on them, right? Well, and that's what we spend on people around them. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, not it's not them, very yeah. little of it by the time the kid is, you know, there. There's, right. uh, here's a couple pennies. But um, so would you, would you, in your kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 utopian scheme, would, would it be something like a voucher program where every, uh, you know, so we don't worry about where that money comes from? Necessarily, you know, we we assume, uh, you know, taxation that throws that money into a bin and then each parent or guardian of each kid 
in school would get that check for 23,000 or 15,000 or 12,000 to spend how they see fit. Is that kind of the, the basic model that you would prefer? I, I actually would prefer that. I would prefer that we have informed parents over time. You don't have perfect parents right now, but informed parents who are resourced. But sometimes to determine soon, parents itself. will be perfected every bit as much. Right? Well, yeah. you know, I don't think that they'll ever be like perfected. Um, but I will say this much. Um, they'll they'll always be more morally in charge than than the government will be. So assigning me to a school against my will is much different than allowing my guardian or my parent to decide for me. We do that with daycare. We do it with colleges. I don't know why in between daycare and college, we assume that there should be no kind of like parental influence on what you learn. Uh, well, they, you, you may have answered your own question when you say, you know, that there, the state wants to produce a particular type of individual that's going to tend to be, you know, color within the lines that they, you know, they, they lay down and, you know, you, you know, you can deal with them when they're little kids and after mm-hmm. college, you know, but um, you know, in your in December, uh, you have a, a Substack uh, called Unpublic, which I uh, recommend to people. You wrote, "There isn't an issue facing Black people today that doesn't find its origin in K through 12 education. Without our own collective governance of our children's intellectual development, how can we win? Without Black self determination and who teaches them what they learn, where they learn, and how less how lessons are taught to them." What is the future of our freedom? Um, and I, you know, this, I think I, I see a through line in what you were talking about. Um, but so what are the sorts of educational institutions, um, temperaments, mindsets, arrangements that flow from that insight? And then how do they also kind of go beyond black, uh, you know, black Americans as opposed to, you know, all sorts of different groups or individuals? Um, So I'll start by saying, like, I spend a lot of time thinking about the 8 million black children that are walking into public schools every day that aren't ready for them, public schools that aren't helping them reach their highest potential, because I do believe that that failure, that particular problem actually causes us all problems down down the road. Right. So there may be lessons to be drawn from elsewhere. But listen, we are drawing lessons from elsewhere when we think about like the, you know, the the Maori people in New Zealand, for instance, who at some point felt like they would never get a fair education within the colonist system of New Zealand. And they created their own K through 16 system of Maori education to reclaim their children, to take their responsibility and to educate in the way that they saw fit. Right. Um, we've seen in the United States there there's been some American Indian movements around doing the same thing for their kids. You can't sit around and keep putting your children into a system and handing them over to another group of people and complain about the outcomes without the fingers always coming back, pointing at you saying, well, then take your children and do something for them, right? And I think what we have done, honestly, is after 1954, we shut down a bunch of black schools, we fired a bunch of black teachers and black principals, and we lost all of the the developmental capital, the educational capital that they had built up around teaching black students. People talk about pre-Brown as if we were making no gains, but that's a lie. Actually, since emancipation all the way up until 1954, Blacks were fastly closing the gaps when it came to high school graduation rates and participation, school participation, and everything that matters. But we got rid of all of their capital, their educational capital. We fired them. We handed our kids over to a new group of people with this weird promise that we would be free by integrating and getting rid of our educational capital. And it hasn't worked out. You know, it's been, you know, (laughs) it had a good run. It's been about 60 years and we have declining fortunes on that promise. It was one of the biggest miscalculations of the black middle class legal strategy and civil rights ever. Um, Because now we're having to reclaim our kids again. And we're talking oftentimes as if we're not responsible, like the system is not teaching our kids, the system is not doing this and, you know, uh, or that for our kids. And at some point you say, okay, so what are you going to do? Right. Take your kids back, get them out of the system. (laughs) Yeah. You, you have uh, written about, uh, you know, uh, I mean, this is not a new dynamic or or kind of argument within the black community. Um, uh, You've written about Booker T. Washington and W.B. W.E.B. Du Bois. 
Um, and you seem to come down very clearly on Booker T. Washington's idea that Blacks should create their own institutions that allow them, you know, that they both own literally and figuratively and kind of can control and kind of hold on to. Uh, whereas W.E.B. Du Bois talked about things like the Talented Tenth and a, and a kind of integration model that definitely served people like him, people who were intellectually advanced and, and upwardly mobile. Um, you know, that your what's what's fascinating to me about like the way that you're talking about this is that black separatism for lack of a better term seems to be very much out of fashion among uh elite circles in uh you know in most uh white you know white conversations as well as black conversations what is the constituency for what you're talking about here well on one i wouldn't call it black separatism i mean i feel like i am responsible for my kids to develop them and train them and, and raise them so for me it's just parental responsibility and if i do that from a lens of being uh an american indian or a black person or a white person in san francisco wherever we all have that same responsibility to do that and if i'm a gillespie i'm hoping that my kids grow up with some irish orientation in their lives i hope i don't know i, I don't want to assume Gillespie. You know, I, I, I don't I, by assume, the way you know. i want to point out my my grand <laughs> parents all left Ireland to leave it behind, you know, so right, there's certain it types okay. of inheritances <laughs> that are best left, you know, 3,000 right. miles away. <laughs> Well, and I'm just saying I wouldn't I wouldn't fault you if that was your orientation and how because America is made up of people that have different orientations. Raise your children and raise them if you want them to be, you know, within your uh, uh, like we're Lutheran. My kids are being raised Lutheran. If you want them to be raised Catholic, do what you got to do. But um, I wouldn't call it separatism necessarily. But one orientation that we don't talk about is historically black colleges. Um, it's funny how much of the integrationist ideas break down when you get to something like historically black colleges. We're not talking about closing them. We're not saying that they're separatist or that they're a problem. We're not even calling them segregation. Um, as a matter of fact, Morehouse, I believe it was, had a white kind of valedictorian. <laughs> um, and there's some, many, people don't know this, actually many um, um, historically black colleges that have now flipped and become white um because they did were you go, where so did much. you go did you go to college where did you go uh, was yeah it so HBCU actually or? it's um so i i did the the two-year track so i did community college um also did uh um uh, professional credentials afterwards and i'm in college right now at goddard <laughs> at goddard college one oh, of the wow. most, uh, uh yeah in vermont that's what, one of the yeah most that's one of the great colleges. hippie schools of all right time. like yeah. where um uh very dewey in um um unstructured and uh gave you people like fish uh the band fish and uh um <laughs> <laughs> and and macy uh, uh one of the actors um so while so i have wildly open ideas about education when it came to my own kids i was more like you have to make it all the way through 16 uh k16 uh unlike i did from the very beginning but we were open how we got there. In terms of um, kind of thinking about educational institutions and structures, um, you you call yourself libertarian. You There's a strong individual streak in, in everything that you say and do the way you, you carry yourself. Uh, but you also talk about the we. Is, is Black um, the, the right level of identity to think about education or Catholic or whatever? I mean, how, how do you... How, how do you kind of, um, you know, do a, a cost benefit analysis isn't quite the right term, but how do you how do you settle on why blackness as the operative variable here, as opposed to, say, a, a you know, a student centered learning establishment or whatever? It's an interesting question. This is how I think about it. Um, it comes down to the individual level. And if you're Mexican, you have a Mexican orientation on the world. Right. I don't know whether um whether we can argue you should or you shouldn't maybe you just shouldn't think of yourself as mexican or you shouldn't think of yourself as puerto rican or whatever but i think um we are a nation of individuals who have orientations um that are given to us from our families from our cultures from our past our religion uh, i identify very clearly as a christian um that's problematic for some people or what you know whatnot um, if we could stay out of each other's business, if I get to be a Christian black libertarian who has open ideas about education and music and, and art and what is culture, then we're fine. It's not until we start trying to think of canonical thinking. There can be one Western way of thinking. There can be one story that we tell about America. There can be one way is when we start getting into problems for me as an individual, right? 
Um, so I'll let you do the Gillespie thing. You let me do the Chris Stewart thing. Our kids will have different orientations and the world will be better for it, right? So when I think about black, we, we you know, I am black, my family is black. Um, and we do have to think collectively about um, the data that we have that tells us that we have very clear problems. We have very clear issues that we need to solve, which require solutions. So what are the solutions gonna be? Are they gonna be government solutions? Or are they gonna be solutions of our own making? We have black art, black uh, history, black music. Um, these are all black foods that we eat or whatnot. It's a cultural, um, 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 it's a cultural orientation that we have to work with when we start thinking about how do we solve our problems. And listen, we don't just call ourselves black. You know, the world calls us black. The world hands us data that says you have an achievement gap. You have a home ownership gap. You have a, you know, high school graduation gap. You know, keep going down the list of all the gaps. Um, and those are real. They're, you know, race may be a social construct, but it has material consequences, right? Race may only exist truly in language, like a Wittgenstein type of thing. You know, it only exists in language, but there are material consequences to that thing that only exists in language. Talk a bit about, you've, you've written about research that shows that, um, you know, having black, uh, uh, black children who are taught by black instructors do better. Uh, what is that? Because that, you know, and I'm thinking from a kind of super doctrinaire, libertarian, individualist, you know, kind of ethos. That is, um, you know, you want to follow the science or, you know, empirical work, but you also, you know, it's like, no, I want, I don't want that to be true because I, I want to believe that individuals are simply individuals. What is, what is the evidence that Black students prosper when they're taught by Black teachers? Um I mean, there's been research on it. So it's been researched over time. There's lots of research that we have. Re we have researched that white teachers see black students as older than they actually are, less innocent than they actually are, less capable of, um, of grade level um, work, even when they qualify for it, less gifted than they actually are when by science, we can prove that they are more gifted. So we have all of this uh, research. This isn't made up. This is all research. So this is one of my problems when we start getting into, especially with conservatives and liberals, conversations about race. And it becomes this thing about racism exists. No, it doesn't. You know, there is no such thing as racism and there is such a thing as racism or it's not that important or it's very important or it's systemic or it's just individual. Um, I find most of those to be not terribly serious conversations about race. Bottom line is you put a black child into a classroom with the white teacher and there's lots of research that tells you what that dynamic is. And it also you put a, a black kid in a school or in a classroom with a black teacher for one year it changes the, traje the trajectory of that child in some ways, but two years straight, it also changes the trajectory. Also, if a kid goes to, to church once a week, it changes their trajectory. If they go twice a week, it seriously changes their trajectory. So doctrinaire, libertarian, Gillespie, um, there are just some things that are going to be true, whether you believe in God or not. Um, it's just true that if you go to church, it actually changes your life uh, if you're a black kid. Um, if you believe in race or racism or not, it's just true that if you put a kid into a classroom with a black teacher, it's different than if you do with a white teacher. And uh, people have to ask themselves why, especially people who spend so much time pretending that racism is just an overwoke theory that's baked constantly on the left to foment division. They have to ask themselves why when they hear a stat like that about research like that. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, woke wokeism because that <laughs> is, you know, it's a huge topic in, um, in education, uh, especially, and you, you are both critical of woke activists with, and you, you deride their um, bumper sticker slogans and, and certain fixations, but you're also equally critical of anti-woke analysts. Um, and you, uh, you wrote a, uh, a long piece critiquing uh, a critique of the San Diego public school district um, from the right, uh, where a person was saying that, you know, San Diego had just given up to wokeism and was no longer going to grade students. It wasn't going to punish them for handing in things late and all of this kind of stuff. And you, um, you uh, talked about, um, you know, how being woke is its own problem, but being super anti-woke is another type of problem. And you introduced in this conversation 
the terms crypt, cryptomnesia and anglonesia. Can you talk about that and where, you know, where you think both of these sides are kind of missing the boat on what's important? Yeah, I think so. On the left, I think the woke stuff goes too far when it goes into territory where you just, no measurements matter anymore. It doesn't matter whether the kids are learning as long as they're getting introduced to movies that show Che Guevara and blah, 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 right? So um, that to me is its own problem because illiterate people uh, is a problem for any society. So um, if you don't believe in measurements about whether or not your fourth graders and eighth graders can read or do math or do algebra or do geometry or whatever, as long as they um, have all the right buttons on their lapels and whatnot around liberal causes, that's a problem for me. That's a huge problem because I actually want thinking people to rule the country. And right now, um, we, are, we have had a, a coup. We've had a moron coup. So thinking people have actually been displaced from their own leadership of the country. We have actually literally lost. Thinking people have lost. Um, so the left is damaging, I think, by not respecting real measurements about learning and demonstrative knowledge. Can you demonstrate what you have learned? On the right, I think there is such, you have so many cultural warriors on the right who only want a single story taught about the United States and they only want a single way of doing things. And they are so dogmatic that they don't understand that they are not the only people that exist on the planet and there can't be one story ever. Um, they do the opposite of what the left does. So you just get this spy versus spy thing. It just becomes this like this two groups, the duopoly just engage in this long-term moron battle. And the rest of us who want to be third-party people and just want to take the world as it comes actually are really without a home right now, I think on both sides. So you can hyper-polarize issues like the San Diego thing, which San Diego has real problems just in general about all of these but I think like the Cato Institute folks might say to you, someone like Neil McCluskey might say to you that a lot of this is the problem of just trying to have a common school, like a common school system. It wouldn't matter if you have leftist woke people over here and right cultural warriors over here, if they all could go to a school of their choosing and we didn't try and cram everybody into one system. Um, that definitely would work better for me. And I'm critical of both of them because I don't think that they see the damages and the, the limits of their dogmatism. You know, in um, one of the critiques against the contemporary school choice movement, and particularly anything that's uh, kind of smacks of vouchers, is that it is a way of resegregating uh, public schools or public education or K through 12 mandatory education might be a better term. And, you know, there's truth to that in the 1955 essay that Milton Friedman, where he introduced the kind of idea of vouchers as we talk about them still, he tips his hands to the segregationists who were uh, do, engaging in what became known as massive resistance against Brown versus Board of Education and integration. Um, you know, and, uh, and there are other people who say, you know, that the entire edifice of uh, public choice economics, um, you know, Nancy McLean in her book, Democracy in Chains, uh, you know, said that all of this stuff is, is a, a variation on white supremacism. Um, you push back against the idea that school choice, the school choice movement is somehow inherently tied to um, white supremacy or, and, and I, I want to say, and resegregating the schools, but you're not necessarily against a certain type of segregation, but where, you know, why is it wrong or what, it, what is the history that you draw on to show that the school choice movement actually is not first and foremost about segregating schools um, so that whites can, can learn at a faster clip than blacks? Yeah, so I think there's two things in your questionnaire that are really important to me that I would pull out. I tease out, first of all, as libertarians, we believe in free association. So that's a different principle than segregation. Those are two different words to me, but they, they fit in the same bucket. We can have that discussion separately about, uh, you know, I believe racists have a right to be together <laughs> if they want to be together. I actually was a, a witness in a case here in Minnesota. We have an integration lawsuit right now. Um, and I was, a, I, was, I was a witness in this case. And the attorney on the side of integration asked me very clearly, so Chris, it would be okay with you if a bunch of white supremacists started a school of their own, you would be fine with that. And I said, well, you're not going to like my answer, but the truth <laughs> of the matter is that would be doing me a huge service if they could all be together, right? Because at least I know that's where they go together, right? 
Um, and that actually is not a flippant answer in my mind. It's true. Let the, you know, why, why would I want to force them to go to school with my kids? Anyways, not a very popular answer um, these days. But the fact of or the idea that uh, school choice is basically a segregation Trojan horse is um, factually inaccurate inaccurate and historically inaccurate. Historically, we've had lots of different ways in which uh, people have either gone to school or not. Um, the oldest school choice program, I think people like Corey DeAngelis and others will tell you the oldest um, school choice programs in the United States far um, predate the Southern resistance movement of desegregation, right? So Vermont and, and Maine and other places had ways of which um, Ashley Berner would tell you that, you know, we're, um, we're a world laggard when it comes to offering school choice. So all of the Western world actually um, um, pays for people to go to private schools, religious schools, non-religious schools, different types of schools. And they're not doing it because they're Southern segregationists in the 1950s in the United States. They're doing it because they see a principle of freedom and being able to go to a school that fits within your own world orientation. Um, as a matter of fact, in the um, you know, Declaration of Human Rights, the global, the worldwide human rights, uh, Article 26, number three, I think it is, basically says that parents have a right to choose the kind of education that their children will get. That's not because they, they want to segregate the world. It's a human right. Um, um, people look over Milwaukee, Oftentimes, Polly Williams and Dr. Howard Fuller and others who fight for the choice movement there, they do it from a very black power, you know, um, um, philosophy and black empowerment philosophy, um, born of fatigue with all of the promises of integration and other things coming to save us. Um, so anyways, let's just call it what it is. It's a very clever argument, mostly formed by um, communications consultants that work for the teachers unions who have figured out that that's one of the emotive ways that you can get to the American public to, to change the public mind around choice, right? Imagine if we started applying that to other things though, like food choice or, you know, clothing choice or blah, blah, blah. Music. You know, yeah. Music. Yeah. We're just mm -hmm. all going to, we're going to have two kinds of music from now on country and Western, right? Like, <laughs> so, so everybody else be damned. Right. Um, um, we wouldn't go for that, but we go for it in education, which is weird because that's the thing that develops your mind. What, um, you know, uh, you, you spoke pretty uh, eloquently at an outraged uh, or an enraged way about the duopoly um, kind of throttling down uh, decisions. We are speaking a little bit before school choice week, but it's actually the day we're talking is when Donald Trump is leaving office and Joe Biden is coming in as president. Um, you are critical of Donald Trump in many of your writings and across the board. At the same time, he is a, you know, as much as any president has been, he's been a, a proponent of school choice. Uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, whatever, uh, whatever else one might say about her, big proponent of school choice, uh, particularly in K through 12 education. Um, what did you think of Donald Trump's, what do you think of his educational policies or legacy uh, when it comes to things like parent-centered education of their kids? It's a hard question to answer because he got nothing done, really. Um, he's, he, Donald Trump actually is not a Republican to me. Donald Trump is not a conservative to me. Donald Trump um, said many things, but like the Barnum and Bailey type of person that he is, he said things and then forgot them 30 seconds later. He almost block granted, he almost crippled the, the development of charter schools, for instance, by block granting the money. Um, which was a weird, abrasive attack on on just the expansion of something that breaks down the the monopoly system. And is of that if he zone. block granted it, he gives it all to the states, and then the states are generally going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of hostility towards charter schools. Yeah, I mean, think about your state, California. Imagine like Gavin Newsom being, you know, in control of the the, the spread of charter schools. He's already he's already demonstrated a level of pragmatic hostility towards charter schools. He wants to be president one day. He can do nothing better to get the left and to get the teachers unions than to go anti-charter and start shutting them down. Just so happens in your state of California, some of the best performing schools for some of the hardest to educate students are charter schools, right? 
Um, I haven't seen a national program of spreading school choice. I haven't seen vouchers fall from the sky like manna. Like if we went back four years ago, there was a promise, an explicit promise that were made for those of us that believe in school choice. Chill out. We got this. Watch what's about to happen. That was four years ago. It's four years later. The government monopoly on education couldn't be stronger. Um, they spent a lot of their time trying to undo Obama era policies that were uh, superfluous, so, you know, working around the fringes. And, we, and parents are no more empowered in my mind, no more empowered today than they were before. So what we had was lots of fancy talk. I would argue that George Bush and, and uh, Barack Obama got a lot more done for school choice in their time. Uh, as presidents than this president who's leaving now, I really hope Republicans reclaim their center on these things again and and start delivering. You must be very happy that we have a new president coming in who worked, you know, for Barack Obama. Uh, what I'm is pretty your... happy. Yes, I am happy that we have someone <laughs> other than Donald Trump. I don't know that I'm happy necessarily that it's Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah, talk about yeah. Biden. What do you think of Biden's education plans and his nominee for Secretary of Education, uh, Miguel Cardona? Yeah, it's hard for me to predict because I. I just think, first of all, uh, Joe Biden's a career politician who's been very much a hardcore centrist. Um, and for many Democrats and leftists, he's been to the right of the center for them. So um, so it's kind of an open book. And I think it was a clear I, it was a clear shot from him when he didn't choose Randy Weingarten or Lily from the NEA, the National Teachers Union's leaders, as his education secretary, that he wasn't going hard left on his education policies. But now, you know, his deputy secretary is a, a, a Branch Ravichian. You know, she's a Diane Ravitch person from San Diego. So um, I'm really confused a little bit because uh, his Cardona, who he chose to be the education secretary is pretty mild, mild mannered, hasn't been hostile to charter schools, hasn't been necessarily hostile to school choice. Um, but his deputy secretary has been so we'll see. Um, I'm waiting to see but I feel he's a, enough of a pragmatist. He's a private school parent himself. Um, he's a Catholic. Um, I would hope that the school choice lobby would be working on him right now. Although you did, uh, you wrote a piece, uh, I guess, uh, from late last year uh, that was subheaded, instead of making education great again for unions, maybe the president should make it better for all students, regardless of where they learn. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Well, listen, you know, you have lots of uh, public school teachers and unions and supporters who publicly say, listen, the majority of our kids, 90% go to public schools. So therefore we should spend the most opportunity, uh, the most resources to give them the opportunities to learn. Um, and that to me is really a little bit of a disgusting type of um, um, way of seeing the world. Because first of all, you're saying that 10% 10, 10 doesn't matter. Now apply that to any minority of any sort. What if we said, you know, listen, 90% of marriages are between people of the same sex. So why are we spending any time thinking about those people or, you know, of, of different sexes, you know, heterosexual marriage? Why are we spending time thinking about people in same sex marriages? We would never go for that. Children learn in many different contexts. When you're the president in the United States, you have to be the president of homeschoolers, the president of private schoolers, of Catholic schoolers, of magnet schoolers, charter schoolers. You're the president of everyone. So to allow public employees unions to get you to repeat the idea that only the 90%, and it's really not 90%, let's be clear, it's more like 83% um, are in traditional schools. And many of those say that they would go to a non-public school if money were no ob object, right? So um, so I have a problem with the idea that Biden would say he wants to be the president of all Americans, he wants to be the healer, and then he would take a hard left on something like education that's so important to so many families. Do you, um, do you think that teachers unions uh, or you know, teachers more broadly, but especially unions, the way that they responded to the lockdowns um, and the way that they continue to, um, is that doing real damage to their um, political interests? Because, you know, I, I can't think of a school district, particularly a large school district. I live most of the time in New York City. You know, I've been spending some time out here in California. I, I, my kids went to school in Ohio. Um, I've lived all over the country. I mean, I, I cannot think, but I, I cannot think of a public teachers union that has covered itself in glory when it comes to we need to open, we need to do whatever we can to get kids learning, et cetera. They have all almost to a, a you know, 
uh, to a, a person have been saying, we are not teaching, you know, our, our primary function is, is, you know, doing well by us. We don't care about the kids. We don't care about opening schools. Give us more money. Uh, give us less accountability. Do you think that the COVID lockdown is really going to change, uh, you know, the way that teachers and teachers unions are viewed? I feel like they still have the sympathy of the public. I think, you know, um, teachers unions are very smart about how long a strike should go on or how long they should stick with um, a strong stand on something. They're probably like, they're almost criminally insane. They're so smart about how long you do a thing to get to your goal or your agenda. And they right now are starting to say things like, we are all for opening schools safely. We want kids to um, um, go to safe schools and we want our staff to be safe. Public's very sympathetic to teachers and to sentiments like that. As time wears on, the patients will run thin and they will change because they've always done that. You just mentioned New York. New York Teachers Union is very smart about how long a strike should go on. So is Chicago. Um, in the beginning, all the parents are with them. All the public is with them because we just, we don't pay teachers enough. We beat them up. They have a thankless job. They're with our kids all day long. We want to consider them all to be Mary Poppins. And that goes on for about two or three weeks of you being out of work and whatnot. And then you start saying things like, I love the teachers, but, right? And they listen for the but. Right now, the but hasn't kicked in. There's still the idea that, um, that we have to get kids back in schools, but we have to do it safely. And I guess in a weird way, uh, your experience of having your kids around, people might be more than willing than ever to say, you know what, I, I understand what teachers are going through uh, because I'm dealing with yeah, my Yeah, I'm gonna bastards. say a provocative thing here, uh, Nick, which is just this. Um, <laughs> I don't know that everybody likes their kids as much as they love them. <laughs> like people love their children. I don't know that they like them as much as they love them for one. And I don't think that there's been a time like now where they've discovered that more. And I will also say there might be a lot of people who actually predicated their decision on having children in the number they had on the idea that they would be in government <laughs> schools all day long. So the government's not holding up its end of the bargain right now. Let's talk a little bit about your um, your path to libertarian ideas. Um, how do you where did, how did that happen? And, uh, you know, how do we uh, how do we create more people like you? I, I love the way that you're inherently kind of talking about education as an extension of individualism um, and that, you know, that that's going to take a lot of um, kind of unplanned and unpredictable forms and coalitions and things like that. But how did how did you come to call yourself a libertarian? Um, for me, libertarianism in the beginning was just like this grand compromise. Like, um, we, we can argue, we can keep arguing about all these things, or we can just let each other be. And um, I get to just be responsible for what I have in my own world. And let's just stop arguing. So um, I was a, a Nader voter <laughs> in the 90s. Um, you know, I was very much on good government. Um, you know, the consumer should rule. Um, and that actually is what led me into libertarianism, joined the Libertarian Party in Minnesota in I want to say 96, 98, like in, you know, in those years, uh, was a volunteer on the Jesse Ventura um, campaign for governor in Minnesota. And really, that was, uh, to me, really submerging in the Libertarian Party um, politics, because he wasn't with the Libertarian Party, but he had been a Libertarian Party all-star. Um, and for me, it just became this grand compromise of... Um, um, we have a drug war that doesn't make any sense. We are making black people and black communities a casualty of really bad policy in so many ways, education, the war on drugs, over policing. And of all of those things, I think to, if anybody was really having an honest discussion just amongst black people today, for instance, and, and I, I know this isn't your orientation, but, um, and we put three people on stage, the duopoly and the libertarian on stage to have to answer for policies in the United States. It would be the libertarian policies that would have done the least damage, first of all, and offered the most freedom. So um, things around like the war on drugs was catastrophic for our community and people don't talk about it. People love to talk about the, where, the welfare state. They don't love to talk about the warfare state, right? Um, and And it just makes sense to me. Like you wouldn't have, a, should a guy die because he's selling cigarettes outside of a store, right? Is that, is that cause for a death sentence? Well, one party would say maybe. The other party would say no. 
um, and and one party would say hell no, <laughs> and that would be the libertarians. So for me, that that was the orientation. It wasn't super ideological, although the uh, the ideology made sense to me. There are things about it that didn't resonate with me, like the whole Ayn Rand atheist uh, libertarianism never has resonated with me. Um, but it's just practically speaking, um, it's where I locate the most political hope for solving black problems, if that's my goal. How does your Christianity uh, infuse your libertarianism? You mentioned, uh, you know, Ayn Rand, who's famously, you know, not just an atheist, but a super atheist on steroids. Um, but a lot of a lot of people I know who are Christian are also libertarian and see a connection there. How you know what what is the connection for you or is there one? Yeah, I think that um, um, <laughs> it's interesting because the, so much of the radical Jesus that people don't teach and don't talk about is about freeing yourself and throwing the yoke of the world off. You're in this world, but not of it. Don't join things that are not of you. Um, and we, many Christians, I think, go the opposite direction, which is is um, is a problem for me. They nationalize Jesus. They nationalize it. patriotism becomes their new God, the flag. They pledge to a allegiance. They pledge allegiance to something other than Christ. Um, they treat a, a piece of cloth as if itself actually is, is mystical and metaphysical in ways that's weird. Um, so for me, um, Jesus talked a lot about freeing you of the world and leave the world and and don't be like, you know, beholden to it. And for me, that is a lot of, of the libertarian ethos. I know you had asked me previously about Galatians, um, because in my Twitter byline, there's Galatians 5.1, which is, um, um, and I don't want to butcher it. So uh, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery and really to me it's like i've made you free and i've freed you do not go back to things that enslave you don't be don't become a slave again right um and and for me that fits very well within the the libertarian orientation because number one we are trying to free ourselves of many things mostly of the way that government actually programs us and polices us and keeps us in a box um, but once you break out of those things, don't go back to it again, right? Um, so that's how it fits together for me. I know it's not everybody's way of looking at it. And the Ayn Rand thing is very strong. I've been in many discussions with libertarians where I'm like, see, the good thing about libertarians is you don't all have to be one thing, right? You can be a left of center libertarian, a right of center libertarian. You know, there are people who call themselves libertarian leaning. I don't know what that means. It's like kind of pregnant. Um, and you can be a Christian libertarian. For sure. Um, you know, you, um, in again, in our kind of conversation as we were uh, scheduling this and whatnot, you, um, you express some interest in um, kind of uh, ways in which libertarianism might be sold to blacks or, or to uh, people like yourself. Uh, there's little question, I think, that, you know, the libertarian movement sociologically has been largely white. It's been largely male. You know, what is what are the ways that we should be selling this philosophy or, or maybe, you know, maybe philosophy is too strong a word, this kind of orientation, this temperament, this predisposition or whatever. Um, you know, what, what are the ways that we sell it to people in your community who otherwise might think there's only a choice between, uh, you know, kind of liberal and conservative attitudes towards things? I mean, I uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I honestly don't have a hard time you know, so-called selling it. I think there's such a freedom orientation to black thought. Black thought is seen to be in a struggle and the struggle is seen to be like a struggle for freedom. So if you, if you go all the way back, I mean, I would consider that, you know, you have people like Frederick Douglass in my mind is a, is a libertarian. Booker T. Washington is a libertarian, not a conservative, a libertarian in my mind. He believed that like uh, versus W.B. Du Bois, he believed that true freedom is like owning yourself and owning your stuff, right? Like, and you can fight to be part of somebody else's system if you want to, but no one will ever take you seriously until you own yourself and you own your stuff. Um, um, so I don't think that it's hard to make the sale so-called if, you, if you're talking about freedom. And the struggle for freedom and the struggle to be free, just to be free of the things right now that um, have us, you know, the call for defund the police 
which I know is, is such a complicated conversation when you get into the duopoly. But if you just stand aside for it and you say, is it smart to have militarized local police departments over a period of years where they can do asset forfeitures that actually just use money to remilitarize themselves over and over and over again to the point where they do no knock warrants, where they do stop and frisk, where free people are being stopped and asked to present your papers and, and empty your pockets and whatnot. Um, if you can get out of the duopoly discussion of that, you don't have a hard time selling libertarianism, I, I think, uh, uh, to to black freedom fighters, people who want to be free um, at some point. So I don't know if that's that's enough of an answer there, but I do know, I think that there's serious damage to the sale, if we're trying to sail, by right-wing cultural warriors who are, call themselves conservatives and especially black conservatives, right? I actually think no one is doing more damage to let the libertarian sale to black folks than black so-called conservatives. Does that include people like Thomas Sowell who gets, um talked about a lot um and seems to me you know he has certain libertarian elements and certain very conservative kind of culture war uh type of things uh, who who are the black conservatives that you think are undermining um a kind of move towards individual freedom and uh and liberation um well here's the kindest way for me to answer that if you have black conservatives where 90% of what they're saying is that black people are wrong about something and white people are right, that's a problem. If you have black conservatives who are super popular with white people for some reason and get retweeted constantly by white people, but there's no black people ever in the room and, and they're gaining weight from all the free dinners that they get and they're, they're loving the attention that they get. And, but there's never anybody black in the room when they do this routine that they do. And, um, and if 90% of what they're doing is making white people feel really good, like really, like, I don't know why this guy, I don't know why more black people don't talk like him. Um, you might have a problem like Jeff, Jeff Fox, uh, Foxworthy yeah, might you. say, you might <laughs> have a problem with your black conservative. The problem with them is um, you want to make me a slave again by selling a single story. I don't need 1619 or 1776 to give me what should be the story of what America should be. I'm a thinking person. I will figure it out for myself. That so, is such a, uh, a, a, a deeply libertarian idea that there are multiple stories. Uh, and also that the stories are going to change, right? Because right. as new information happens, as things. So let me go back to a question that um, I really want you to answer because I, I found these terms fascinating. Cryptonesia and Anglonesia. Uh, what is crypto, cryptomnesia? What is that? So cryptonesia is um, when you forget what you've stolen from somebody. So you've taken some something from somebody. So um, one of the ways I've seen cryptonesia explained really easily is that um, you have Dane Cook. Do you remember Dane Cook, the, the comedian? So Dane Cook tells this um, story about naming his kid a name with no vowels in it. It's just going to be all R's. So, you know, we're going to call him or whatnot. Someone does some, um, some looking and they figure out that CK um, told that exact same joke six years earlier, right? And Dane is like, no, this is my joke. I made this up, blah, blah, blah. The two of them get together and meet and it's determined that, no, you stole that, but you forgot that you stole it. You saw it once and there's, a, there's actually a literal term of stealing something from somebody. When we talk about things in education, like the educational debt, the reason that I use the word cryptonesia is people f have forgotten what has been stolen from black people in terms of education over years. So we talk about them today. We talk about the statistics around black education as if black and whites actually come from the same place and they had the same history. And, and at some point all debts were wiped clean and they were exactly equal and then black people decided not to be on track decided not to, to catch up and to me that's a classic case of cryptonesia no for a good number of the years that we've existed in the united states it was illegal to even teach us to read after that uh, um, we made some serious gains most of which were wiped out and people don't talk about this enough in 1954 with brown um, so the left and the right have i think some answering to do for where we are right now that's cryptonesia to me forgetting the debt that you have to people of what you did to them indian boarding schools i think is a great example we forget about indian boarding schools but, but to our own peril if we want to be thinking people right so that's cryptonesia uh, what about anglonesia 
Anglonesia is when you do that and you're a white person. <laughs> <laughs> Anglonesia is when, as a white person, you say things like, I just don't know why those black folks are not, you know, at the same level that we are right now, as if there's no such thing as history, as if there's no such logical answer for how the 80s related to the 70s, related to the 60s, to the 50s and back, right? Generation by generation. We just talk in terms as if there was this thing called slavery and then there was emancipation. And then it was, a you know, it was a, you know we were all equal and we just don't know why. Um, so San Diego is a good, uh, good example of that. When you, the piece you're referring to when I use both of those terms is you have the cultural warrior right who are so hyper reactionary to any change to anything that has to do with race that they are i think miscalculating what is being done with this one policy in san diego around students being graded for like handing in things late you won't be graded the same way or you know punished the same way well that's wokeism that's over wokeism or whatnot um San Diego has racial da data. They have very different outcomes by, by race there. They're trying to solve their problem in multiple different ways. And by the way, that is not true that they're not going to ping you anymore for turning in late. They're just gonna take it out of your academic grade and put it in something called the citizenship grade. So you will still be graded poorly for turning it in late. But people are so hyper-reactionary that they, that they jump in on it. Yeah, I mean, this is, it comes up a lot where if, you know, what is considered the canon of, you know, great American literature or something, uh, you know, if that changes at all, it's always a bad thing as opposed to kind of looking at, you know, how how is a canon, uh, you know, created in the first place and how is it always kind of being added to and subtracted from in a kind of fuller conversation rather than just attacking something as always, always being worse than whatever it, it replaces. Well, can't we just save ourselves a lot of trouble just by not arguing about those things? I mean, listen, if you love, I, I'm bored to death. I'm bored to tears by Shakespeare. If you love Shakespeare, then I love you. <laughs> then do your thing, right? Um, don't tell me that as a thinking person, I don't have a right to not consider Shakespeare to be one of the greats. Don't consider me a bad person if I think that the movie was better than the book, right? Let's just be individuals about this and say, your canon may not include James Baldwin, but mine does, right? Um, Diane Ravitch, very weirdly and famously in her book, um, Death and Life of American um, Schools, talks all, all about all this top-down stuff in the book that she's against. And towards the end, though, she presents a canon and the only, I, I believe the only two black people on the list are Dr. Martin Luther King and maybe Booker T. Washington or whatnot. And I thought, why would you, that's good for your family. That's good for Michael Ravitch, your son. Um, I want my kids reading Baldwin as much as I want them reading anything else or whatnot. So why do we need to have a canon? I think we need to have a canon because there is a cultural war. Um, and I don't think libertarians should be cultural warriors. I think we should step outside of the cultural war because that's endless, it's needless, and it's actually what makes busybodies. America's biggest problem in my mind is busybodiness. Like, right, if we can't just stay out of each other's business long enough to like just live our lives, we're gonna continually have arguments about curriculum and about a kind of school and even our politics. So, um, so I'm not for it. I'm not for a canon. I'm not for 16 or yeah, 1619. It was so flawed. It had so many, it was trauma porn in my mind. And the only thing that made me lessen the rhetoric that I had about my criticism of 1619 is 1776. <laughs> That's the only thing that made me reprieve, give, give a reprieve to 1619. What, um, you know, as a kind of final question, um, you know, in a year, um, you know, school choice week will happen again in 2022. Um, how will we know if we've gotten closer to a, um, an ideal that you would feel comfortable with of, of expanded school choice? Well, one, if we're putting more resources directly into the hands of parents. So if anything that, if there could be a super big silver lining out of COVID, it's that we finally get over the hump where we trust parents enough to have some determining power of how the resources are allocated. So um, there's a school in Colorado, for instance, that 
um, just allows the parents to move $1,000 of their per pupil at, to determine what it is. And to me, that's the cam camel's nose into the tent. You know, 1,000 can become two, could become 3,000 of the per pupil. And that, that is you get the to parents so, can use a thousand bucks to further their kid's education as they see fit. Yeah, that, well, they can take, they can determine how that thousand is spent right in in service of their their kids and that would be great if that became two and then three and then four um ed choice actually is one of the organizations that i really really um love a lot and they have a national map of what types of school choice programs are available in every state it would be great to see the number of those expand in response to the pandemic in response to closed schools um, um they would probably i think want more esas but i want you know, education savings accounts. I want all forms of of voucher or parent determining devices or instruments. Um, and a year from now, I'm not hopeful that all of this is going to change. What well, we didn't talk in this discussion, and which is just kind of, I think, the elephant in the room always is the educational establishment's power to maintain what they have right now is hard to move. It's hard to shift. It's. it's I mean, huge. if it's hard to get, uh, you know, kind of police unions and prison guard unions to move, they're nothing compared to the educational establishment. Not right? at all. Yeah. Not at all. And the public has a very different response to the teachers unions than they do to all those other unions. So when you beat up on teachers unions, you're beating up on Mary Poppins, and that's a problem for America. Well, we'll uh, we'll check back in in a year, if not sooner, and we'll see if uh, Mary Poppins has been bruised as, as a <laughs> result of events on the ground. I want to thank Chris Stewart. He is, among other things, the CEO of Brightbeam, a nonprofit network of education activists demanding a better education and a brighter future for every child for talking to reason. Chris, thanks so much. Thank you for having me.